Uh, welcome everyone uh, to Fall 2020 Pratt Institute's Earth Action Week, uh, Race, Health and Climate, and the keynote uh, discussion today on environmental racism and what has been done and can be done to uh, fight back against it. Uh, my name is Leonel Maponce, and I am the academic coordinator of, Pratt, of Pratt's uh, Master of Science in Sustainable Environmental Systems in its uh, Graduate Center for Planning the Environment within the School of Architecture. Uh, while we wish, uh, and I'm one of the coordinators for the Earth Action Week as a whole, uh, which is being run through the Pratt Sustainability Center. Uh, we wish we could uh, have this event in person and have it be even more interactive, uh, but we thank you for joining us and hopefully some of us are, some of you are able to join us precisely because we are doing this uh, remotely and thank you for taking your time in the middle of the day to do so. Um, before we begin today's session, I want to share a couple announcements on Pratt Earth Action Week and how you can continue to engage us in the future. Uh, I just put in a link, but I'm going to put it again uh, for the week's events. If you have signed up for this, you'll likely know where this is, but I encourage you to look for uh, the rest of the week's uh, programming uh, and see if there's anything else that interests you. Uh, it, the week runs from, uh, from last Monday, September 21st, and it goes through Saturday, September 26th. Um, we have uh, live virtual events uh, every single day, and they will also be recorded, captioned, and made accessible and available to watch on the Pratt Sustainability Center website. And I also believe this uh, this specific panel will be available at other in other uh, formats and places within Pratt's uh, web infrastructure, including the, the the library guide that's being prepared for uh, to go in conjunction with this. Um, in addition to the presentations, we also have a student exhibit, student work exhibit, which is an ongoing project. Uh, we will be populating it with previous exhibits and with uh, ongoing and future work in the, in the coming weeks. But uh, this current um, batch of uh, student work is from spring and summer, uh, and it should begin to uh, give a sense of uh, Pratt Institute's commitment to uh, the topic of, of this week, which is the intersection of these three crises of climate, uh, public health, and race and, and social injustice. And now I want to kick off today's section and introduce you to the speakers. Um, one second. Uh, first, first up will be Samara Swanston, who is the legal counsel to the New York City Council Environment, Environmental Committee. Uh, she's a visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute's Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment, teaching uh, environmental law and planning law. Samara has been engaged in the practice of environmental law for more than 25 years. During that period, she always worked to protect public health and the environment at the federal, state, and local level. She was the first drafter of Article 57 of the Environmental Conservation Law, creating the Long Island Pine Barrens Maritime Reserve Act and saving a globally rare dwarf pine forest. She worked for the Environmental Protection Agency as a Superfund attorney, and her work led to the creation of the Region 2 Environmental Justice Work Group. She helped draft the 1992 EPA Environmental Equity Report, and she received the EPA Gold Medal, the highest agency honor. Ms. Swanston was the first drafter of all of the local and locally enacted legislation requiring the use of renewable energy, including the use of geothermal energy, solar photovoltaic, solar thermal energy, and in-conduit hydropower. She is currently the Legislative Counsel to the Environmental Protection Committee of the New York City Council and a visiting professor at the Pratt Institute Graduate School for Urban Planning and the Environment, or BCPE. Uh, after Samara, uh, Priya Mogankar will be, Mo, sorry, Mogalkar will be uh, presenting um, her work and the work of New York City Envi Environmental Justice Alliance and New York Renews Coalition. Uh, Priya is the Resiliency Planner at New York City, at NIJA for short. Uh, she is a climate activist and urban planner based in Brooklyn, New York, and currently serves as the Resiliency Planner of New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, where she leads city and state level climate justice advocacy and community resiliency campaigns, including with New York Renews and Climate Works for All. And she will talk a lot about these different uh, actions and initiatives and coalitions at the city and state level and beyond. Uh, and our moderator will be Saray Jarrell Johnson, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Librarian, Assistant Professor at Pratt Institute and Co-Chair of Black Lives Matter Pratt. Uh, Saray uh, is a writer and a librarian for, from Piscataway, New Jersey, and he currently serves as Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Librarian at Pratt Institute Libraries, where he is Co-Chair 
of BLM Pratt. Slingshot, his debut collection of poetry published by Night Boat Books, was the winner of the 2020 Lambda Literary Award in Gay Poetry and a finalist for the CLMP Firecracker Award. He is a 2020 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellow. And with that, I will kick it off to Samara to give us an introduction on environmental racism and environmental justice and the legislation and regulations that govern it. Thank you, Lionel. And thank you, Sairi and Tyler and everyone who was kind enough to invite me. I, I was asked to speak uh, about the work I've done in, in the EJ movement by the students. And I spent 30 years as a volunteer in the movement while working as an environmental lawyer. And this is a defining moment in the EJ movement because we also spent the, the past 30 years avoiding saying environmental racism. And we were even judicious of our, with our use of the word racism very carefully. Uh, I define environmental justice as equity in the distribution of environmental burdens and benefits. The modern EJ movement tends to focus on pollution and environmental burdens, but you cannot have good environmental quality without an equitable share of environmental benefits as well. The EJ movement has always had environmental professionals who were volunteers, and I'm one of those volunteers. Uh, I, I was a super fun attorney in 1990 uh, in EPA, and I was introduced to the EJ movement by my manager at EPA, Eric Schaff, who told me that the EPA was organizing around environmental equity. <clears throat> and we called it environmental equity because saying environmental racism was considered too controversial in 1990. Uh, Eric Schaff told me to try to get myself on the environmental equity work group, and I did. And the term environmental justice came later. I spent the better part of two years traveling to Washington, D.C. for weekly meetings with what became the environmental equity work group. And we drafted the first EPA report on environmental equity. And I started the EPA region work group, where I was given the, uh, ultimately given the EPA um, gold medal. Uh, early in 1992, before the first People of Color Environmental Leadership Conference, I got into trouble with some folks in the movement for saying that climate change was worse than Superfund sites in the United States. Unfortunately, that was and is true. The United States and Europe are responsible for 25% of the planet's historic greenhouse gases, and China only recently surpassed our own global contribution to greenhouse gases. Yet the environmental burdens of climate change will not fall equally on everyone. People of color and poor people face the greatest risk from climate change. I was in Washington DC on my own dime when President Clinton signed the executive order on environmental justice. And then during the past 30 years, I also wrote um, a bunch of law review articles on environmental justice that were heavily cited. Um, and later, I went on to work for the New York State DEC uh, as a Superfund manager. And then one day at my desk, I received a phone call from Eric, Eric Goldstein of NRDC. And it seemed that NRDC and the Open Space Institute were representing WE Act in their nuisance lawsuit against the North River Sewage Treatment Plant. And the North River Sewage Treatment Plant had been brought online without odor controls and it was stinking uptown. And it would cost $50 million to fix that problem, I read in the Times. NRDC and Open Space Institute got standing in that case because of the claims of the 10 or so individual plaintiffs who alleged physical and economic injuries. The case was going to settle, this was the end of the Dinkins administration, and then Eric Goldstein called me and indicated that the case would be better served if I represented the individual plaintiffs who were concerned about the proposed settlement. I stepped in gratis to represent the individual plaintiffs and so saved the standing and the settlement, which was um, $1.1 million. Later on, I got a phone call from Peggy Shepherd of WE Act, and I learned that Peggy, I learned from Peggy that the Tri-State Transportation Campaign organized by EDF 
had uh, raised $800,000 to organize around mass transit. And their funders told them they needed to add people of color. And they reached out to Peggy and she brought me along. At, at the time, Nija was meeting, but had no money. At the meeting with EDF, we, we told them that we had organized a citywide network of organizations working on environmental justice, Nija. And they told us, we needed a mission statement and bylaws. And if we had those, we would receive 10% of the money that they raised, um, which was $80,000. <clears> that night, I went home and Guadas drafted the first mission statement for Nija and the bylaws. And true to their promise, the Tri-State Transportation Campaign gave Nija its first funding $80,000, and both organizations are still doing well today. While working as an administrative law judge with the Department of Environmental Protection, I also ran a small not-for-profit called the Watch Person Project. And I developed two original uh, EJ projects with the Watch Person Project. One project looked at residents in incompatible mixed-use buildings in New York. And working with Hunter College, we measured air quality in residential apartments above printers, dry cleaners, and nail salons. And my research highlighted incompatible mixed uses and was published. I was the basis for introduced local legislation. And I also worked with the Sierra Club on inequity in access to the New York City waterfront. And working with the Sierra Club, the Watch Person Project played a role in getting the state to purchase the North 7th Street site in Williamsburg as open space with the first Environmental Quality Bond Act. And that site ultimately became the only public access left on the very crowded Williamsburg waterfront. During the past 30 years, I worked as an environmental lawyer. And part of my work at the New York City Council involved drafting the New York City <clears throat> environmental justice local laws. Initially, one local law had been introduced when I arrived at the City Council in 2007, but it was written by an out-of-state non-lawyer, and it had a few problems, let's say. Uh, over the years, I repeatedly revised it. I argued for a hearing for the bill and for another bill which was another EJ bill, which was introduced by council member Costa Constantinides, who's my chair. Costa promised me the bills would get hearing, uh, get a hearing. And after 10 years, the bills finally did get a hearing and were later enacted in 2016. I also worked with the EJ advocates in the movement to draft and revise the bills. And the EJ advisory group now includes both NIJA and WEAC. Teaching at Pratt has been a privilege, and I've been here since 1994 or 26 years. Clearly found a home at Pratt. However, I also taught environmental justice at Pratt many years ago. Jamie was one of my first students, and at Bard College, where I developed my own casebook, including the earliest access to parks cases often forgotten. Uh, since the election of the current president, Almost all the progress we had made in the environment in the past 30 years has been undone. The NEPA regulations have been revised and weakened. The NEPA guidance to incorporate climate change into NEPA considerations revoked. The NEPA mountaintop, the, the mountaintop removal guidance that had been um, revoked by President uh, Obama reinstated. The Clean Power Plan, which limits greenhouse gases from power plants, revoked. In fact, uh, as more than 110 actions taken by the president, um, they have taken us backwards into the past. He proposed less efficient vehicles. Who wants that? He withdrew the US from the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, that will be effective November 4th. Uh, an election day surprise. And uh, currently, the, 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 ideally, the current president would like to take America back to the 1950s, I feel. However, nothing says 2020 like the presence of the coronavirus, ubiquitous mass, and his management of the coronavirus. 
So with the unmistakable EJ impacts from the coronavirus, combined with particulate matter pollution in communities of color, the pandemic, pandemic offers another opportunity to engage in additional EJ volunteer work. And I am currently working on an EJ project examining the relationship between particulate matter, major sources of pollution in New York City, and the coronavirus. So research from Harvard disclosed the relationship between the coronavirus and particulate matter. Um, particulate matter is a, a criteria pollutant for which the federal government has promulgated national standards. And I'm working with two college students, uh, a CUNY law student, uh, a, a lawyer from Columbia, and my old friend, Mike Girard of Columbia, looking at that relationship between particulate matter and the coronavirus. Because it turns out that the coronavirus attaches to particulate matter and particularly to PM 2.5. So once you inhale PM 2.5, <clears throat> you can't expectorate it. And it remains lodged in your lungs. When it combines with the coronavirus, it causes and exacerbates <clears throat> the disease. Ideally, my hope is we'll develop a basis to monitor and mit mitigate for or control PM 2.5 as expeditiously as possible. And we will enact a local law to require mitigation. If we can reduce particulate matter pollution in the near term, maybe we can prevent more people in communities of color from sickening and dying. So this is my third original EJ project, but hopefully this project will also save lives. And now that we can say environmental racism, we can also call for an end to it and a replacement of systemic racism with systemic and comprehensive reinvestment in our communities long ravaged by racism, discrimination, and longstanding health inequities. Race plays an outsized role in American society that impacts on most things we do. Race should not determine the type of health care you receive, nor should it determine where polluted facilities may be cited, but it does. We need race conscious solutions to address the problems of race in our society. Colorblind solutions will perpetuate the environmental inequity that harms all Americans. Uh, and I will uh, take questions. I also prepared some action items when people want to talk about them. Thank you so much, Samara. We will definitely come back to your uh, quest some questions for you and also some action items. So folks, uh, be thinking about that while we go to our next presenter. Priya Malgankar. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, um, Lionel and Saray, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. It's such a pleasure to be in the, the virtual room with Samara, who's legendary. Um, really appreciate it. Um, my name is Priya Mulgaukar. I uh, use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm calling from Canarsia and Munson Lenape lands. Um, I am the resiliency planner at the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, we are a citywide network of 11 grassroots organizations serving low income communities and communities of color on the front lines of environmental racism and the climate crisis. Um, I'm also on the steering committee of New York Renews, which is a statewide coalition of over 200 grassroots organizations that was the driving force behind the nation's most ambitious climate justice bill, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which uh, went into effect uh, in January 2020 and was passed uh, last year. Um, I also co-steer the Climate Works for All Coalition, um, which is a city level uh, coalition of environmental justice, labor, housing, and community groups uh, fighting for a local just transition and good green jobs um, that help us address our climate goals. Um, so I really appreciate Samara grounding us in um, really critical environmental justice history um, and underscoring just how high the stakes are in this moment. Um, I just think it's really important um, to understand that the environmental justice movement um, has been going strong for over 30 years um, and is really at the forefront of, of the climate movement. Um, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, as we're, you know, in the midst of climate week. 
Um, I'll try to use my remarks to draw some of the links that um, exist between um, the climate crisis, racism, and the current pandemic and economic crisis that we're finding ourselves in. Um, you know, we're amidst a really powerful resurgence of the movement for Black lives against entrenched police violence and white supremacy. Uh, we're, you know, seeing the health and economic fallout of a pandemic that is ravaging the lives of uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color. And at the same time, we're seeing, you know, whole swaths of our country um, ravaged by climate change fueled forest fires and inundated by hurricanes. Um, all while we're here in New York, you know, bracing ourselves for the next climate disaster. Um, so we can see really clearly how the legacy of environmental racism has shaped the outcomes of the pandemic and the climate crisis. Um, you know, as Samara, uh, Samara's research is, is really highlighting critically, um, the data is confirming what environmental justice activists, you know, aren't, aren't surprised to see at all, which is that people of color and low income people have been assaulted first and worst by this pandemic, um, both in terms of exposure, death rates, uh, as well as the economic fallout. Um, you know, and the same policies and factors that put people of color and low income people most at risk um, to COVID-19 are rooted in um, the historic environmental inequality and racism um, that really shapes our city. Um, racist housing policies, um, land use decisions, um, and other um, you know, legal uh, actions have placed power plants, highways, waste facilities, and a whole host of other noxious uses um, squarely in communities of color. And you know, the disparate long-term health impacts of breathing in pollution like PM 2.5 uh, are really more evident than ever um, during this pandemic, which is linked to, you know, respiratory outcomes. And uh, as Samara highlighted, um, exposure to PM 2.5 um, has been linked to an increase, uh, increased risk of complications and death from uh, this virus. Um, we're also seeing millions of people that have lost work and income as a result of this pandemic. Uh, which has also hit people of color the hardest. Um, all while, you know, we're waiting for the federal government to finally take action and send relief funds uh, after months and months of suffering. Um, so right now, community resiliency that is rooted in racial justice and environmental justice is more important than ever. Um, it's really clear that we need to think holistically about what resiliency really means to include um, public health, climate change, uh, racial inequality, uh, and our entire economy. Um, a really concerning parallel between the pandemic and climate change is really just out how unprepared our governments and our economy are to respond to disaster, and how those with resources are much better able to shield themselves and recover while vulnerable folks are left defenseless. Um, and the failure in our response to this pandemic really reflects the gaps in disaster response that we have witnessed and will continue to witness in moments of climate emergencies. Um, you know, as summer comes to a close, um, you know, we look back and have seen that environmental justice communities in New York City who were hit hardest by COVID are also the most vulnerable to extreme heat. Um, you know, New Yorkers who and, and who also suffer from higher rates of asthma, respiratory issues, um, you know, whose best defense really is to stay home um, during this pandemic. Um, but these same folks have to deal with skyrocketing electricity prices, um, you know, a constrained grid, um, selective blackouts and brownouts by Con Edison, which not shocking to anybody in this room, uh, disproportionately harm black and brown New Yorkers. Um, and you know, all of these risks really intersect when you understand that the kind of ways that communities keep cool in our city, um, like going to the beach or going to the park or being outside, um, there's a higher risk of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of violent enforcement of social distancing for black and brown New Yorkers. Um, and, you know, the kind of intersection between skyrocketing energy costs and poor uh, respiratory health outcomes is also linked to housing and housing justice and the fact that low-income communities of color are more likely to live in substandard under um, you know underperforming housing that costs more to keep cool and that um, you know has poor indoor air quality um, so I just wanted to I know that's like a lot of stuff, but I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, this example because I think 
it's really critical to constantly see all these issues as interrelated. Um, and, and because we see all these issues as interrelated, that helps us craft solutions that are also intersectional and interrelated. Um, so our response to the triple threat of racism, climate change, and uh, the economic fallout of this pandemic have to be transformative. Um, you know, I keep hearing people say they want things to return to normal. Um, the idea of returning to normal also comes back a lot in conversations about resilience, um, which the kind of classical definition of resilience is, you know, the ability for people to bounce back from disaster or disturbance. But we really need to think beyond bouncing back because we know that the economy that we, you know, were relying on in the past disproportionately extracts and harms people of color and uh, reinforces the kind of white supremacist roots of our country. Um, and we really need to think beyond that and uh, toward uh, an economic recovery and a long term just transition that will enable frontline communities to thrive. Um, and now is really a critical opportunity and moment to do so. Um, so in my work at NIJA, uh, we work in coalition to fight for massive policy changes that can help transform our economy uh, so that we're investing in frontline communities and creating good green jobs. Um, you know, we know that we need unprecedented levels of investment um, to uh, draw down our emissions, to bolster the resilience of our communities, um, and to create, you know, a just economy. Um, and, you know, thanks to uh, the tireless organizing of the New Yorker News Coalition and the thousands of folks who uh, are supporters of the coalition, we were able to pass, um, you know, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, um, which now requires that New York State draws down our emissions and achieves a carbon neutral economy by 2050, um, while also ensuring um, that at least um, 35% of all the investments in clean energy, energy efficiency, renewable energy, have to benefit um, disadvantaged communities, which is the kind of legal term we are using to encompass environmental justice communities, people of color, low-income people. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, meeting these goals um, should really be fundamental to any just economic recovery plan in the wake of this pandemic. Um, and in fact, we really see this moment as an opportunity to propel us forward to those climate goals by doubling down on creating good green jobs. Um, you know, and on top of this kind of immediate call um, for a just economic recovery, um, we also need long term investment in a just transition, one where polluters pay for the damage that they have done to communities of color and to the climate and that money um, would go directly to frontline communities uh, for solutions that can shift us to a regenerative economy, um, one that prioritizes health and wealth and resilience uh, for our most vulnerable. Um, so I'll just wrap up by sharing that excellent Audre Lorde quote that um, folks uh, share a lot because it's so poignant. Um, There's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Um, and I think this quote just really encapsulates the legacy of the environmental justice movement um, as one that is led by low income people and people of color. Um, but it's also this kind of political moment we're in where we're seeing um, the links between the struggle against mass incarceration for housing justice um, and for climate change solutions as all inextricably linked. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for letting me join you all. Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Bria. So um, we're going to move into the next part of this event. Um, and I'll ask our panelists a couple of questions, about four, so two each. And then after that, um, audience members will have an opportunity to ask any questions they may have. So if questions have come up for you while uh, Priya or Samara were speaking, please feel free to drop those questions in the chat now and we'll put them in a separate document. Um, or um, call on you and you can unmute yourself to ask them either way, uh, that whatever way feels most comfortable. So my first question is for Priya, which is, can you talk a little bit more about the just recovery work you're doing at the city level and how that addresses environmental racism and racial justice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the just recovery work that we're doing at the city level is through the Climate Works for All Coalition. 
uh, which I mentioned is a, gr a group of uh, a dozen or so environmental justice, economic justice, uh, labor, um, housing, uh, and other advocates um, that have actually been around um, since the People's Climate March in 2014. Um, so some of the policies that we've pushed in the past include um, the Dirty Buildings Bill, which requires that the dirtiest um, buildings in New York City have to uh, drastically um, slash their emissions by 2050. Um, but, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, we um, have really shifted gears, um, you know, in response to the clear economic fallout um, to uh, how we can actually create a just recovery and move us toward a just transition at the same time. Um, so, you know, we developed over the past couple of months a platform called um, the Climate and Community Stimulus Plan, uh, which is our vision um, to create uh, a whole host of infrastructure investments and projects that will put 100,000 New Yorkers back to work uh, while drawing down our emissions and bolstering resiliency. Um, so, you know, we have the kind of twin goals of creating um, career track union jobs and reducing local carbon emissions um, as kind of the root of that. Um, and, you know, we kind of like everything that Nija does, we want to make sure that racial justice is at the root. So we want to make sure that job training and job placement is prioritized for um, communities of color, uh, particularly those most impacted by uh, the pandemic and from the the, um, the unemployment crisis of the pandemic. Um, so I'm happy to share a little bit more um, details about that in the chat. We're actually um, releasing a report uh, on October 20th that outlines our full kind of job creation plan and all the different sectors that would be uh, target that we'd like to see targeted for investment. Um, and the investment really come from like federal funds, state funds, city funds. Um, yeah, and I think it's our vision that this would really uh, not only kind of bring back, like, well, I don't, I don't even like to use the word bring back, but like actually create like new systems of wealth creation and economic justice for communities of color, um, but also really like be the basis for a new renewable energy economy in New York City. Thank you so much, Priya, that's incredibly interesting. So my next question is for Samara, and I was really glad to hear you, um, of course, mention uh, that the U.S. is going to be leaving the Paris Climate Agreement in a month or so. Um, and I'm wondering how you think that might affect uh, communities of color and cash poor communities. Well, um, obviously, it's a mistake to leave the, the Paris Climate Agreement. And although Donald Trump announced that he was leaving, it doesn't become final until the day after election day, November 4th. But that puts the onus on us to make sure that we all go out and vote because if we don't get an opportunity to get new leadership, we will be lost. We will miss the opportunity to avoid the worst effects from climate change and they are going to fall most heavily on communities of color and low income communities throughout the world. So we actually have to change. I'm not 100% sure that if, if we got a new president and did everything we're supposed to do, we could, we could avoid the worst impacts of climate change. We have like seven years left or something like that. But <clears throat> if we don't get a new president, I don't see it. I don't see that happening. So we will be totally, um, I can't even begin to say how it will affect us because we let, we share the planet. So everything that happens has to be a, a joint effort. If we want to get to the future, everybody's got to be involved. And if we think we can go it alone, good luck on that. Thank you, Samara. And could you just like briefly say what the Paris Climate Agreement is? I should have asked that beforehand, just to, uh, for those who so, We entered into an agreement with the nations throughout the world to reduce our greenhouse gases. And basically each country gets to set its own reduction level. So, I mean, it's, it's, this is not a really hard thing for us to do. We figure out what we can do and we do it. Um, the Paris Agreement also said, and by the way, as to those smaller countries, 
they're going to need assistance. And we both should be transferring uh, money to the smaller countries so they can move ahead, but also we need to transfer our technology. If we think we're going to, they, the, the India and, and China and other places can, can get to the future without the appropriate technology, we're kidding ourselves. And frankly, it ought to be transferred gratis, no charge, because we need everybody to get to the future. So in, in my world, we would be giving every country, the big ones, the small ones, all the, all the um, third world countries, all the so-called third world countries, an opportunity to get to the future. But if we don't, um, we're all going to be imperiled, not just, the, not just the countries that include people of color. We work together or we lose it all. Thank you so much, Samara. So this next question I, um, is for Priya, and I think it's an especially interesting one um, uh, and very relevant, um, just like what Samara just spoke about so eloquently. Um, Priya, what are some of the ways your members are thinking about the intersections between environmental justice and calls to abolish and defund the police? Yeah. So I think fundamentally um, at the kind of root of both of those calls is the same critique, which is that white supremacy and settler colonialism are at the root of the climate crisis and um, the system of mass incarceration and policing. Um, and that obviously both of these crises disproportionately affect black indigenous people of color um, first and worst. And so I, I, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations with our member organizations about, um, you know, drawing these kind of really critical calls together. Um, and, you know, kind of the framework that we're talking about this in is that it's really about, you know, divesting from systems of extraction and oppression um, and investing in regenerative community solutions. Um, so, you know, one example um, for, you know, a vision of abolishing jails and prisons um, is through this um, plan that we uh, co-developed called Renewable Rikers, um, which is essentially um, taking this institution of Rikers Island, uh, you know, abolishing, I mean, the kind of long-term vision of abolishing uh, the carceral state, but the kind of short and medium-term vision of taking this site of, you know, traumatic extractive oppression and turning it into an opportunity for uh, you know creating regenerative solutions whether that's a solar farm uh, other green facilities that could also employ um, in good career track union jobs folks who have been most impacted by the carceral system um, sort of related um, I don't know if folks heard this really incredible victory um, from one of our member organizations called Uprose in Sunset Park but they've been in the midst of this huge pushback against um, industry city uh, rezoning the industrial waterfront in Sunset Park um, you know industry city and a lot of rezonings in New York City really embody gentrification and the displacement of um, you know people of color and it's very much intimately linked to the policing and the use of police to um, you know enable gentrification um, and the kind of vision that Uprose has had for this um, you know alter alternative vision for the waterfront is really about creating uh, a world-class working waterfront um, that can actually build wind turbines and can build all the components for uh, you know uh, microgrids and uh, energy efficiency uh, materials or be a job training center uh, for folks most impacted by jails, policing, environmental racism. So I think the more that we kind of uh, bring together these movements around, um, you know, divesting from a white supremacist economic system and investing in communities of color, um, and at the same time in our climate and our health, um, that's really going to build the power we need to actually have like transform like actual projects that are doing this work. Um, so it's sort of about bringing that framework to life in actual projects. Um, and thank you, Leonel, for sharing the uh, Uprose Grid um, plan, which is um, the, the kind of alternative vision for Sunset Park. 
Thank you. And the final question uh, that I have for Samara um, before we go to all of your questions for Priya and Samara is what is NEPA and how does it provide tools to address environmental racism and its inequitable impacts on black and brown communities? So NEPA is the premier environmental law that um, was enacted in 1969 to uh, require that before we take any actions, we look, we stop, we think, we look, and we prepare, we even mitigate the harm. In other words, NEPA looks at, we never looked at all of our resources and figured out if we were gonna use anything up. But NEPA says, what, it, what is here and are we going to use it up? And for every major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment, NEPA requires an environmental impact statement be created. And the concept of NEPA, which was, again, goes back to 1969, has spread throughout the world. The idea of taking a look and doing a study before you act is critically important. And it has spread to like the state level. So we have state environmental quality review statutes. Um, and most states, well, most states, about half the states have environmental quality review statutes. And the states that don't will take an action without looking at the consequences. But it was originally envisioned that every state would look at the consequences of the action and look at subsequent generations and make sure we act as trustees for subsequent generations and preserve some of the resources so that other people can, uh, our children and our, and our children's children will have something to um, enjoy at the end of our lives. So NEPA is supposed to look at that. Um, and it's, it's very, very important that we study these impacts and that we make sure we're not causing adverse harm um, when we take an action, when, when, uh, when the federal government takes an action or when the state takes an action or when they get a permit or approval to do something. And unfortunately, the, the current president has uh, substantially weakened the NEPA regulations and they, they become final. And the only thing that will save us is if the, we get a new president and he or goes back to the old NEPA regulations, which encouraged everybody to participate, encouraged public uh, weigh-in, and required that you mitigate harm to the extent that you can condition permits or approvals or funding on mitigation. So NEPA has that little piece that hasn't been changed yet that you can condition um, approvals on mitigation, and hopefully we will um, we will get NEPA returned to us, or we won't be looking at the impacts of our action as we move forward. Thank you so much, Samara. All right, we're going to go into audience questions. We don't have any in the chat, but um, I'm hoping that people have them in their brains. Um, Someone has a comment. I have heard the seven year statistics cited before. I've also heard it as 11 years. I'm wondering what exactly will happen at the end of those seven years. Thank you. I think this refers to the time we have to make a change, right? <laughs> Samara, do you want to take this on? Yeah. Hi, Emma. How are you? So, yeah. <clears throat> um, the seven years and the 11 years. Well, um, it's basically seven years until we will be unable to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So um, we expect to have more pandemics. We expect to have increases in temperature. We expect to have, um, for example, North America just had its hottest uh, year ever. And, and the planet just had its second hottest year but it can get hotter. Can you imagine a future where it gets to 121 way more regularly? That's our future if we don't. Uh, so there's, there's things we can do now to maybe limit the impacts, 
But as time goes on, there, there will be fewer and fewer things we can do to limit the impacts of climate change. Yeah, I'll just add uh, and in response to Rebecca's question in the chat a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that statistic is both useful and not useful sometimes because, um, and, and just to clarify between like the seven or 11 years, it's that report came out um, in 2018. So the kind of clock is ticking for, you know, lack of a better word. But um, yeah, I think to underscore what Samara said, it's really that kind of deadline from the IPCC is about the kind of staving off the worst effects of climate change. I think it's important to acknowledge that like cli the climate has changed. Um, we are seeing the effects of climate change now. We've been seeing it for probably decades. Um, so it's just important to acknowledge that as we're transitioning our economy, we need to also think about uh, bolstering resilience and disaster preparedness and all the kinds of ways that we can keep communities safe. Um, and thriving, um, even as we will see the world dramatically change. Um, yeah, it's, it's understandable that that kind of figure is confusing. Um, and I'm happy to address a little bit of Rebecca's question, if that's okay. Sorry if I'm just jumping in, um, which is about um, the discrepancy between the IPCC's deadline and the CLCPA. Um, so, the CLCPA ultimately um, requires that we achieve a kind of carbon neutral economy. And just to parse out what that really means and a little bit of like movement history from New York Renews. So the original bill that New York Renews um, pushed, um, the Climate Community Protection Act, wanted to see a 100% reduction in our emissions to, to levels that would be considered safe. Um, in the kind of negotiations and as often happens when you're fighting, you know, for really transformative legislation, ultimately you're like butting heads with Governor Cuomo, you're butting heads with different legislators who are trying to weaken the bill and try to water it down. And the kind of place that we landed, um, because a lot of environmental advocates don't see it that it's possible to draw down our emissions 100% and go and completely cut emissions, that we need to have what's called offsets. Um, which basically to give like a really specific example that came up in the bill negotiations a lot, there are certain processes like concrete um, facilities that just emit carbon emissions or emit um, greenhouse gas emissions by nature of how they operate. So the argument is that it's impossible to reduce those emissions because it's just part of the, the, the industrial process. And so a net zero or carbon neutral economy kind of mean the same thing, would envision that like, let's say this concrete plant continues to operate, you would also need to offset those emissions by planting a forest, for example. Um, and we at NIJA and a lot of environmental justice and climate justice act activists are really skeptical of, of these kinds of these arguments about net zero and carbon neutrality. We're certainly supportive of investments in nature-based carbon sinks and, and means of um, you know, reducing emissions through planting trees and things like that. But we're worried that that will just let uh, certain industrial processes off the hook and certain polluters off the hook. Um, or you're seeing, I'm sure people have seen like when you buy a flight, you know, or in the past couple of years, you can buy like a carbon neutral flight, which supposedly means that your flight is offset from some investment in trees somewhere. There's just so much evidence to show that those investments either don't happen, were already going to happen, or don't actually have the carbon benefits they're supposed to. So I just want to be mind, like make people mindful of and wary of those kind of false solutions. That all being said, I think um, you know the kind of the the thinking behind our 2050 target as the New Yorker News Coalition is that that is the absolute latest that we can reduce our emissions. Like we would like to see a much more rapid transition of our economy. We'd like to see us reduce as much of our emissions as we can in the next seven years or five years mm -hmm. um, until we like hit that ceiling where it's like really, really, really challenging and, and then also dismantle those things that make it challenging. Um, so just naming that like, yes, that is the kind of 
IPC, IPCC standard year is like 2050, but we definitely need to transition much, much faster. Right. Okay. Our next question is, how can we get wealthier people? Sorry. Uh, there we go. How can we get wealthier people, folks who won't be or have not yet been affected by climate change as much, to care about climate change and climate justice? Even if we know it's urgent, how can we convince others whose lives are not changed dramatically? Um, I'd like to say something to that. Um, wealthier people can already afford to do the transition to put the money in to transition to geothermal, solar photovoltaic, solar thermal, or whatever's necessary. And that's what they should do now. While other people, communities of color, low-income communities are going to need assistance, wealthier people can save money by transitioning now. So they should look at it as a way to conserve their wealth by saving more money using renewable energy. Yeah, I'll just, I, I totally agree. And we'll just briefly add that like, at the same time, a lot of the, um, th there's actually a really great study that I'll share um, that links wealth to emissions and just the fact that like people with wealth consume more resources and consume more. Um, so it's also like tax the rich, you know and like remove some of that wealth um that's me speaking as priya and not as anija staff member but um i think that's a huge like like income inequality and wealth inequality is like another root of this climate crisis and if we could transition that wealth into community solutions like samara is saying ones that help uh, people of color and low-income people transition that we that needs to be done um yeah that's an excellent point, Priya. Offsetting uh, commercial flights while people fly private jets is not going to work forever. So thank you very much for that. Um, Leonel <laughs> has a question for Priya. Um, what are some, uh, what are the ways in which climate justice and just transitions for black and brown communities are being addressed in developing regulations to implement in the CLCPA? And please do first uh, define the CLCPA. Yes, absolutely. So that is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is a state level bill, uh, sorry, the state level law um, is the one that sets us on a path to a, a carbon neutral economy by 2050. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of ways that the CLCPA and then also accompanying regulation changes and legal changes um, will prioritize black and brown communities. Um, I would say that like a clear example uh, would be through um, agencies and authorities like NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, I think. I got that right. Uh, and it's basically the authority that is responsible for things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, assistance for heating um, bills and energy costs for low income people, uh, programs that can help low income people um, weatherize their homes, which is basically like making it more energy efficient and less consumptive. So we want to kind of trans like transform the way that every agency operates so that it has those kind of um, like needs of low income communities and communities of color prioritized. So that's one of the kind of gr groundbreaking things that the CLCPA does is that every single agency and every part of our economy has to take into consideration uh, benefits for disadvantaged communities. Um, so we want, you know, uh, like the, 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 trans, the MTA and the transit authority to invest in communities that don't have transit access, invest in electric buses in communities of color that have dealt with respiratory issues. Um, so like our interpretation of the law is that like every single authority has to start thinking that way. Um, yeah, does that answer your question a little bit? I was also thinking about the, diff the different panels that have been put together to, to oh, sure. move forward the regulation and enforce it? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So the CLCPA is definitely like a massive, there's a lot in that bill. And one key piece that we made sure to include is 
uh, accountability and um, like participation so that this isn't just happening behind the scenes. So um, there um, was created as part of the bill something called the Climate Action Council, which includes the heads of all of the state agencies as well as um, climate experts, environmental justice experts, who basically are tasked with setting the scope for how we're going to transition our economy. And that scoping deadline is due um, January 2021. And then there's a whole host of advisory panels that have been set up. Um, I'm actually going to be on one of them starting tomorrow. There's like a land use advisory panel. There's a transportation panel. There's an energy panel. I think there's like a housing panel, uh, uh, agriculture. All there's like I think there's 12 of them. I should know. I will check on that. But there are a whole host of different issue-based panels that are basically tasked with informing the scoping plan. So it's you know it's like a big undertaking. Um, but we're working really hard in New Yorker News to make sure that. Um, in every single one of these advisory and scoping processes, we're centering communities of color and centering uh, the dis like making sure that the disproportionate harms that have been done to communities of color are addressed and that uh, opportunities are set aside specifically for communities of color and we're really living up to the mandate about disadvantaged communities. Thank you. The next question is, could you speak a bit more about methods of advocacy and activism that you think are most effective right now? Uh, I'd like to say something about methods of advocacy, if I could. <clears throat> Nothing is given to us unless we demand it. So we have to indicate what we want. We have to <clears throat> we have to step forward and articulate the ways to get there. If, if we don't indicate what we want and articulate the ways to get there, we will not be able to make the changes uh, necessary. So um, advocacy involves getting up and doing something. And, um, and going to the people you know, and also, even if you don't know people, reaching out to them, um, writing them letters, um, um, engaging them, and in that way, I believe that you will um, start your own action. Um, you have to figure out what you can do and try to do what you can do um, within the time that you have available. But uh, target your actions, I believe, to get the most, to get the best results. And, um, and so I have tried to focus on things that I think I can do that are meaningful. And I think everybody should try to focus on things that they can do and people that they know to try to make change. Can I follow up on that really quickly with a follow-up question to Samara? In terms of how NEPA makes its way down through the state and city level, uh, I know one of the ways in which you encourage uh, your students to engage is to write public comment because that's one of the mechanisms that is available uh, to, to the public uh, as a result of NEPA and it's and subsequent le legislation. Can you speak a little bit about what that process is like and how, you know, how people could work to, uh, to submit public comments maybe at the city level where you work? all of my students actually require Samara breaking up she is on my end yeah Samara you're breaking up uh, do you want to take this maybe Priya and maybe start with the other other actions you think sorry uh, sorry <laughs> um Sure. Yeah, I can just briefly hope I don't, I don't want to cut Samara off, but I'll stop if she cuts back in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Samara is right. Like you have to kind of identify what the landscape you were in. Like I, I noticed in in um, one of the comments that um, someone is calling in from Texas and where climate change, the, the rea you know, whether climate change is real is still a thing that people talk about. We are lucky in some ways that in New York, 
that is that we have built enough of a movement here to push back against that. I think that there are, you know, kind of other tangential ways to help build um, for climate solutions in red states and in challenging locations. I mean, like getting progressive candidates in office, um, you know, building uh you know community organizations that can help like mitigate some of the impacts of climate change uh you know connecting with um solar installers and and like fighting for you know like unionization of solar installers like there's just so many components of the movement um for climate justice i think it does take um like just a little bit of digging because i i'll just offer as a resource um we're a part of something called the national climate justice alliance um, which is sort of an umbrella organization of um, environmental justice groups um, that are fighting for, you know, climate change solutions uh, that center frontline communities. And I, I mean, if you do a little bit of digging, I think there might be some folks in Texas who are doing um, frontline grassroots work already. I think just like, you know, keep an eye out and, and find, it's like sometimes it feels like there's no one doing the organizing, but like in most places there are uh struggles happening um and yeah just like think through strategically like what what could be possible um yeah it's it's challenging not every geographic location has the same kind of um uh constraints it seems like you spoke to a couple of the remaining questions do you feel that to be the case priya um yeah. I think we got, we got Samara back. So if you want to build, sorry. <laughs> Go okay, ahead, well, what I, what I pulled from regulations.gov, um, there are going to be revisions of the Medicare payments to physicians, and they apparently will be cutting the Medicare payments to physicians, but will make it much harder to treat coronavirus patients. Comments are due on that October 6, 2020. They are making changes to the critical habitat designation under the Endangered Species Act, which is really bad because they want to take away, if they have an endangered species, it's got to have a home. And if they want to limit the place that it can live, that um, bodes poorly for endangered species. And then there is a um, fireworks display marine safety zone set for um, November 28th, they're going to have a fireworks display in Boston, um, and they want to avoid marine harm with this marine safety zone. But wait a minute, the comments are due on October 21st, so um, whether we should be even having a fireworks display is another issue, but whether or not it can place marine uh, creatures at risk is a third question. And then the, the, the last one that I pulled from regulations.gov, they want to address, they want to give families aid under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. However, before they do this, they want to collect information on the families. And that means it's more likely that they will find, they will be seeking information on the families that, um, to try to disqualify them to find out their uh, immigration status or other kinds of information. The issue is whether collection of information is even necessary for proper performance of the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Comments are also due on October 21st on that. So there are plenty of opportunities for us to look at what government is doing and let them know that either we don't like it or that um, it should be restricted. So um, the, this is just one of the things that people can do if they really care about the environment, you can comment now to make a difference. And this is when I, I require of all my students that they write a public comment. And I find that they all enjoy it and benefit from it. Thank you so much, Samara. So we're gonna wrap up the question part of, of our event um, and move to our action items. So we're just hoping that you'll, um, you Samara and you Priya will be able to leave um, our students, staff and faculty um, with 
some action items that they might want to consider accomplishing um, to help work for environmental justice. Oh, hi, Meta. Well, um, hi, Samara. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, one of the things we ought to do is make sure we register to vote. Um, because if you don't register to vote, then, uh, or if you're not voting, then it's, it's problematic because we desperately need all the people to vote right now. Otherwise, we probably won't have a future. If this guy gets reelected or steals the election, it's going to be very difficult for us to uh, have a, a sustainable future or any future. Uh, so that's one of the things I'd like to see people do as a as an action item. Great. Um, I can share a couple of quick action items. So um, first, I really encourage people to follow New York Renews. Um, you can join our Action Network page um, on our website, which is nyrenews.org. Um, that will help, uh, you know, and thank you, Lionel, for sharing a specific petition. Um, but that, that, I think that's like the best way to keep up to date for how we are continuing to work to, pa to um, uh, to make sure that the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, is implemented in a just way and that we're really seeing benefits to frontline communities of color. Um, so for example, we're actually organizing some virtual lobby visits with our state legislature, st state legislators across the state um, demanding a climate jobs and justice recovery which um, similar to the work we're doing with Climate Works for All is really about making sure that any stimulus funding has to help us meet our climate goals and our equity goals. Um, so um, if you'd like to join a virtual lobby visit with uh, your legislator in New York State, um, I can drop the Action Network page for that um, in the chat as I'm talking. I can multitask, okay, I did it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a really fantastic way uh, to also just like, you know, if you're not usually the type of person who like even knows who their state legislator is, it's really um, a powerful way to get involved in a whole host of political action in the state. So much happens at the state level around housing, energy, climate, you name it. Um, so uh, yeah, totally encourage you to drop into one of those lobby visits. Um, also keep an eye out, we are going to be launching our campaign around our polluter penalty bill, which is a bill that would require, uh, that would um, pl place a penalty on polluters uh, for the damage they've done to our climate and our communities um, and generate billions of dollars every year to help us fund a just transition. Um, if you have questions about that, I'll also include my email address in the chat. Um, and then at the city level with Climate Works for All, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be releasing our uh, report about our, uh, our uh, demands for a stimulus plan. Um, the report's called An Equitable Recovery, Creating 100,000 Climate Jobs for Frontline Communities of Color. Uh, I, I, we, don't, we just set the date for that, so if you want to save the date for our public launch, it is going to be October 20th at noon. Um, and, um, you know, I can connect with the Pratt folks to make sure that um, anyone who's interested and who's on the call today will get an invitation to that. But again, you can feel free to email me if you have any questions. All right. If that's all of our uh, action uh, steps, thank you so much. Uh, again, Samara and Priya, then um, it's time to wrap up this uh, Earth Action Week event. Thank you um, to Tyler, um, Mara, uh, Sino, uh, sorry, why am I forgetting Tyler's name? Um, to Tyler Sino Meridiaga um, from the Center for Equity and Inclusion. Um, thank you to, um, who else do you want to thank, Leonel? Leonel made the I, thank I think that we want to thank the Pratt Sustainability Center and Carolyn Schaefer uh, and uh, Tatsu O'Hara, Eric O'Toole, and uh, Tessa Mapuchi, who have been co-coordinating the whole week and gave us an opportunity to put this panel together and coordinate it. 
I want to personally thank Saray and and Tyler for really jumping in and and making this uh, uh, you know, and expanding the network of of who's really uh, collaborating on, on on these conversations and finding new pathways for for action and, and me too i want to thank them as well <laughs> and obviously samara and priya and and the organizations they work with and you know and, and the great work they've done you know and continue will continue to do to help us really uh try and and bring an end to environmental racism the best we can and and with that as samara was saying you know create a more resilient and collaborative and regenerative uh, network of people and, and resources. Yeah. All right. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us today. Um, look out for a LibGuide if you want to do research on environmental justice or environmental racism coming at you soon. <laughs>